We're concluding the series today uh, that we've been in, and it's called Double Vision. And today, our subtitle, if you want to know it, you've got to put your glasses on. That's what they're for. And don't say it. Okay, everybody got your glasses on? We say it together on the count of three. One, two, three. We are a spirit-filled people. All right. We're a spirit-filled people, and we have been a, um, a seeing, a, share, a sending, a sharing people. Today, we're going to understand what it means to be a spirit-filled people. It's quintessential to the Christian life, by the way. If you have a Bible, you can open with me to John chapter 20, verse 19. And this is where we started this message at the beginning of January. And I'm just going to read through a couple of the verses here and catch you up to speed. John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Okay, remember this story? The disciples were gathered together the first day of the week. They were behind locked doors for fear of the people outside, fear of persecution. And we talked about overcoming our fear to share our faith with other people, right? Remember that? Yes, yes Pastor. Good. Okay. For fear of the Jews, Jesus, hallelujah, came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And when people see the Lord, they, they're glad. That's why we need to be a seeing people to see, help others see Jesus so that they can be glad in him too, right? Yeah, okay. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. He had to say it to them twice because there was obviously a lot of fear here. And as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to take a moment here this morning to uh, do a little theology teaching for you. Just so that we're clear about something here. Because this passage, it says... Uh, when Jesus breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Some people go, well, that's when they were received the, the Holy Spirit. That's where they were empowered. That's where uh, it happened. But didn't it happen later too? And what's the difference here? Wait a minute. He breathed on them here, but then it came again in the, in the book of Acts. So what happened? Well, I want you to understand this particular incident as the conception of the church. In Acts 1-8, when the Holy Spirit comes to baptize them is the birth of the church. And the reason that these are different is because the promises that Jesus made in this gospel concerning what would happen when the baptism of the Holy Spirit came did not happen when this moment occurred. Jesus simply said, receive the Holy Spirit. He was saying, and he breathed on them. It was kind of like an indicator. It was like a uh, uh, receive the Holy Spirit, <sighs> letting them know what was going to be coming. But it wasn't the, the infilling, the indwelling, the baptism of the Spirit that, that was promised later. And I'll tell you why we know this wasn't true. Because the things that Jesus said would happen when the Holy Spirit would come and baptize you didn't happen at this moment. They didn't happen until Acts chapter 1 verse 8. One of those things, uh, when, when Jesus says that he breathes on them... Um, we see that a week, he says, and then you're going to be my witnesses. We see a week later, they're behind locked doors again. We see two weeks later, uh, not only are, are they behind the locked doors, they're, uh, they're still cowering in fear. In the next chapter, we see them fishing for fish again instead of people. And Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you're going to fish for men these guys went backwards. And then the third thing that we see is that Thomas wasn't in this room when Jesus breathed 
on them. And Thomas shows up later and he looks and he says, hey, I see the scars. I see what's going on here. Truly, you must be the son of God. Now we know that a person cannot call Jesus Lord unless it's by the spirit of God, according to the New Testament. So Thomas uh, wasn't in the room. He didn't physically experience the the spittle particles from Jesus' breath and all of a sudden be filled with the Spirit. So he wasn't even there, but the Spirit revealed this to him. So we know that this was not the baptism, but this was the conception of the church. The birth of the church was yet to come. And this is where we pick up in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And Jesus says to them, but you will receive power. Power. Power means I'm not going to hide behind a locked door. Power means that I have strength to do something. Power is a gift when the Holy Spirit comes on you that that the reason God gives it to you is because you need it. If you don't intend to use it, don't expect it. I'm going to say that again. If you don't intend to use the power of the Holy Spirit, don't expect the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. He didn't say you might be. If you want to be, you can be. I hope you will be, he says, you will be in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. We need power to witness for Jesus. I don't know how many of you have witnessed for Jesus lately, but if you have, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It takes power. It takes you going beyond yourself. Listen, it For me, every time, it's not like, oh, wow, I got this thing. Every time, I need the power. I need the power. I shared with a lady at a a business here a couple months ago, and I had to go back to that business and uh, two days ago. And when I went in, uh, she recognized me, and the first thing out of her mouth wasn't, are you here to pay your bill, which I was, The first thing out of her mouth was, I have an infection in my mouth. And she said, it hurts really bad. This is the beginning of our conversation. And I said, well, can I pray for you? She said, please. She reaches across the desk. If you're not ready... If you're not expecting, don't expect. If you're not prepared, you'll be caught off guard. Those moments just, you'll miss them. You know, the other response could have been, oh yeah, I know a great dentist. Uh, Here's his number. I'm going to send you his contact information right now. We need power to witness When you came in this morning, you saw uh, on that side and this side two a piece of plexiglass, and there's four phrases on there. They're very unique phrases to our church. Those are four, four vehicles that we believe will help us to accomplish the vision of reaching a tithe of this city with the good news of Jesus. And one of those is strong families. We believe we need to have strong families to be a witness to other families that they will see the love of God working in us. The second one is served neighborhoods. We believe that when we serve our neighbors unashamedly and unselfishly, when we serve our neighbors, then they'll see the love of God in us and it will be a sign to them that there is someone who loves and still changes lives today. We believe in spirit-filled workplaces. 
where you go in and you work with the, the best work ethic you possibly can work with, and you do your work with a spirit of excellence, and you walk in that place in the anointing and the authority of Jesus, that God will use you in those places to do great things and be a witness for him. And then finally, I don't want to talk to you about this one for a little bit, is supernatural encounters. And, and supernatural encounters, we ask, what is a supernatural encounter? It's when you get your natural self out of the way. Matter of fact, I'm sorry. Um, put your glasses on. I just rolled past it. What does the screen say? One, two, three. Supernatural encounters. Yeah. I was just on a roll. I'm sorry. So... <clears throat> The, the supernatural encounter is when you get yourself out of the way and you allow God, you get your natural self out of the way, and you allow the Holy Spirit to do something supernatural. Supernatural. Well, that's a little scary, Pastor. I think that, you know, do, do those things still happen? Yes, they do. They do all the time. And we need to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and believe that God will do them. It's not my job to heal people, by the way. It's not your job to heal people. That's God's job. It's not your job to save people. That's God's job. You are the mouthpiece. You are the hands. You are the feet. But it's God's job to work through you. Amen. So supernatural encounters. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. Paul says, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power. There's the word power again. Our gospel, he says, came to you not just by preaching, not just by saying eloquent words, not just by trying to swoon you with great speech, with, with such excellent oratory that you're won over. And persuaded. No, he says, it doesn't happen that way. He says, we didn't come to you with excellent words. We didn't come to you with, with eloquent speech. We came to you in the power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. They knew the validity of Paul's ministry here, what he writes about, because of the witness of the Spirit that they saw through him. They knew that it was real. Because they saw the working of the Holy Spirit through his life. I wonder how much stuff would stop on this earth if the Holy Spirit was gone. I would dare say a lot of Christian activity would still go on. Hmm, maybe. They saw, they knew the witness of the Spirit because of Paul's surrender to the Holy Spirit. I want to share with you three ways that supernatural encounters can happen and what they might look like. The first one is signs and wonders according to the gifts of the Spirit. Signs and wonders according to the gifts of the Spirit. And this is, for example, when Peter and John were going to church one day, right outside the temple, right outside the church, was a, uh, a man who needed healing. And they prayed for him, and he was miraculously healed. That was a sign and a wonder. That was a healing that took place. It wasn't them that did the healing, but it was them that took the time rather than keep going on their mission, we're on our way to church. We're on our way to work. We don't have time. We're on our way to this. We're on our way to the ball game. We're late. We're on our way to the concert. The movie starts in two minutes. I can't miss those intros. And there's somebody outside the theater, and they're... They're smoking hard and dragging hard on their cigarette and they're pacing. And you see worry and stress on their face. And, and you're like, uh, yeah, the movie's about to start. But what if you were walking with double vision and you just, in that moment, 
You weren't looking with just your natural eyes, but you were looking with supernatural eyes, and you paused for a moment, and you just went over with a kind word and said, can I pray for you? And maybe the guy was sick, who knows? You might find that in those moments, God gives you a word of knowledge. It's part of the gift of the Spirit. He gives you a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom for them. And you begin to read their mail. You begin to tell them about things that only they and God know. You ever had that happen to you? I have. I have. I've actually operated in that a couple times. It's amazing. I'm just telling you, supernatural encounters are amazing. The Apostle Paul was shipwrecked on an island called Malta. And while he was there, several things happened. But there was the king of this island whose father was sick with dysentery and disease. And Paul says, take me to him. And Paul prays for him and he gets healed. And the rest of the island, Paul was a prisoner, by the way, at this point. And they got shipwrecked on this island. The rest of the island brings the sick and disease to Paul, and Paul prays for them, and God heals them. This whole island experiences a revival. Paul was, he was shipwrecked. He was going to prison. Listen, when your car breaks down, when your refrigerator breaks down, it's an opportunity. Sometimes I think that if we're not willing to open our mouths out there, God will just bring them to your house. Let's see. Hmm. They're, they're AC. They like that AC, don't they? That might get their attention. Why don't we knock out the AC and see if they'll share the gospel with the AC tech? Oh, they've got, they need termites. Be- because the, because the pest control guy doesn't know Jesus. You had plenty of opportunities to walk out there while he was there before, but not this time. You get what I'm saying? Pastor said God's bringing termites to our house. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work through you. Supernatural encounters. So one would be the gifts of the Spirit in in, in this signs and wonders. And a, a second way is joy and peace and the fruits of the Spirit. So the fruits of the Spirit operating through our lives and people see that. Whenever you display the fruit of the Spirit, especially in light of troubles that you're going through, and people look at you in that long line And the cashier is way up there. And everybody between you and them is grumbling and complaining and cussing and mad. And now they're yelling at each other and it's just bad. And and you're there. (laughs) The smile on your face. And you offer, maybe you offer to let somebody in front of you, the person behind you, is complaining really bad. You just say, hey, you know what? Hey, I want you to have my spot. And maybe you just need to say, no, hey, could you take my spot? I, I'm not done shopping. And you just go to the back of the line. When, uh, some of you are like, oh, pastor. <laughs> <clears throat> because when you're kind and everybody else around you isn't, you're creating an atmosphere for opportunity. An atmosphere for opportunity. God wants you to create atmospheres for opportunities. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, meekness, self-control. When you operate in those fruits of the Spirit, people take notice. And when they take notice, that's not the time to go, woo, they noticed me. That's the time to go, hey, did you notice me? Let me tell you why. Because I was just like you 10 years ago. I was worse. Don't don't say that. Say, 
I was, I was 10 times worse than you could ever imagine being in this situation. And you just share your story with him right there. I used to, some of you won't believe this, but personally, I can, I can share this story. I used to, I couldn't finish a sentence without cussing. You should have seen some of your eyes just now. Before I met Jesus, I had to have a four letter word somewhere in my sentence. Or it just wasn't good English. And Jesus changed my mouth. Hallelujah. And I can share with people other parts of my testimony that I won't, based on your reaction to the last one, I'll, <laughs> I'm going to keep on moving. Paul said his preaching came uh, in, in power and in conviction. The, the, next, the next thing that, uh, the, the next way that supernatural encounters can happen is when you are led by the Spirit. When you are led by the Spirit. Because people notice that too. If you're being led by the Spirit, you're not being led by the world. And they notice that you're a fish going in a different, swimming in a different direction. You're being led by the Spirit. People will see that. You're going to look different. People take notice of your lifestyle when the Spirit leads you. Paul said that his preaching came in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. In other words, his words combined with the power of the Holy Spirit were convicting people to believe in the gospel. The, the people that were listening, it was helping them to believe. He was not just there with words, but he was being led by the Spirit as he was speaking. And as he was being led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit used those words to convict the people. You can speak all day long about all this knowledge that you've got, but if it doesn't meet them, if it's not coming from your spirit, from the Holy Spirit within you, it's just, my, 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 my. Charlie Brown, wah, 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 wah. Wah, wah. But when you're led by the Spirit, it's like someone could get up here and sing, and, and trust me, I've seen this happen. <clears throat> Somebody, we could, we could invite, um, oh, Mariah Carey. Mariah Carey to come up here, and she sings Amazing Grace. Wow, she just blew the roof off, right? That's what we would say. Whoa, that was, she was incredible. I got goosebumps while she was doing that. I got goosebumps. But if she's not operating in the Holy Spirit, if that gift isn't coming from her spirit, you just, your flesh just got ministered to. But you could get somebody up here full of the Holy Spirit and they sing Mary had a little lamb and the Holy Spirit is on them working through them. You, you're not going to get just goosebumps. You're going to get a, a heart change. You're going to get something inside like <gasps> the Lord is here. There's a difference. Being led by the Spirit in Luke 24, verse 43, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed. This is our job. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed. We are to proclaim to people that there is a holy God and that if they want to find forgiveness, of their sins, all they have to do is repent to turn from them. That's what, that's what our job is, to share with them the good news is that their sins can be forgiven. We proclaim it to them. It happens through Jesus. And Paul says, that's what's supposed to happen. Forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning in Cape Coral, 
You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father on you. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Over 40 times in this gospel does it that Jesus is referred to being sent from the Father. And now Jesus is saying about the disciples, here's the next phase. As I was sent from my Father, now I am sending you. As the Father sent me, now he's going to, I'm going to pray, John 14, 16. He says, I'm going to pray, and the Father is going to send his spirit to you. Why? So that you'll have power. Why? So that you'll be my witnesses. Why? Because people are lost, and they need to know the way of salvation. So for the time we have left, I want you to stand up with me. <clears throat> At the beginning of this message, I shared with you this idea of the Holy Spirit. He, when Jesus breathed, the people... If you're not serving somewhere and you gotta be somewhere right now, I want you to stay still. I don't want anybody leaving right now, okay? This is too important. Don't check out. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, or, or at the end, excuse me, when Jesus, at the beginning of the disciples' ministry, when Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, it was a precursor. It was the conception of the church. And then later, the church would be birthed when the, the Holy Spirit came. When you received Christ, when you were regenerated, when you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, you became born again, as the Bible calls it, there was a, an indwelling of the Spirit from heaven came. If you built a house, once the house was done, the electric company comes and they plug the electric up to your house, right? You've now got electric electricity wired all through your house. But it, the house doesn't get full of electricity until you power it on. Until you decide that there needs to be a light, that there needs to be a lamp, until you decide that there needs to be an oven that's working and motors that are running and refrigerators. Your house isn't filled with electricity until you decide to turn it on. It's there. And your house is waiting to be filled. So, I want to pray for those of you this morning who you've connected with Jesus. You are believers in Christ, but you haven't flipped the switch yet. The power isn't on. God is wanting to turn the power on today. If that's you, I want you to step out of your chairs and come down here with me real quickly. We're not going to waste a lot of time this morning. I want you to come down. Only if you're serious, God wants to pour out His Spirit on you today. And if you are not sharing your faith with other people, listen, I'm talking to you. If you're struggling sharing your testimony with, with lost people, I'm talking to you today because your switch isn't on. If it was on, you would be witnesses, witnesses for Jesus. He wants every person in this room to be a witness of the gospel for the good of, and the glory of God. Come on, keep coming. We're, we've got time. We've got time. Because this is most important to me. We've been preaching this message all month long to get you ready and understanding the necessity of the Holy Spirit for you to minister in the power of the gospel and the power of His Spirit. 
God wants to release this church into the community. And before that will happen, we have to be released inside here. I want you to lift your hands up to the Lord this morning. If you're down front here, I want you to lift your hands up. <clears throat> and I want you to look at me for a second. Okay, everybody look here. When, the, when, when Acts 1-8 happened and the Holy Spirit came, a mighty rushing wind blew. The scripture says a mighty rushing wind blew. You know why I believe that had to happen? Before the fire came was to blow out all the trash, was to blow out all the dust. If you've got some trash in your life this morning, just take this moment right now and say, God, I give you my trash. Blow it out, Holy Spirit. Blow it out, anything that would hinder the infilling of your spirit today. And I want you to know something else that happened on that day. There were 120 people in that upper room and the Spirit fell on every one of them. There was not a lottery for the Holy Spirit baptism. It comes on whoever is searching and seeking. So this morning, in the name of Jesus, if you're searching and seeking, just ask the Lord right now, fill me, God. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled, Father, in the name of Jesus. Release your Holy Spirit today on your church, on your church. Let every person be filled. Those that are seeking God, those that are hungry, those that are thirsty. Father, pour out living water today in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, power to salvation, power to witness for the gospel. In the name of Jesus, fill them up, Lord. Fill them up in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Church, I want you to begin to pray this morning. Holy Spirit, we invite you. We invite you. Fill this house. Fill this house. Fill these temples today, Lord God. Fill these temples today. Lord, we don't, we don't want to live a life anymore of complacency. God, we're asking to be a people of power, a people of witness, a people of living testimony, a people who are called by your name, Jesus, Jesus. We need your spirit. We need your Holy Spirit. Father God, as you breathed on mankind in the, in the book of Genesis, in the very beginning, you breathed on mankind. You gave us life. The first man, Adam, received the breath of God, the life of God. The second man, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, has come to give us a new life a new life. Lord, I'm praying today for a new life that no one standing at this altar today would ever be the same again. That they would never be the same again. Forever changed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's give Him thanks. Just thank Him. Thank you, Lord. So here's, here's where the rubber hits the road. When you leave here and an opportunity presents itself to you for you to walk in the power of the Spirit 
or in the strength of your own flesh, in the strength of your own mind. God is going to ask you to do something that's not comfortable. It's going to sound different than what you've been hearing. And you're going to need the Holy Spirit to discern this. He's going to ask you to do something that you would not have done before in a new way, in a different way. He's going to ask you to act differently, okay, to respond differently. When you decide that you will obey, he will meet you in that moment. He will meet you in that moment. And as uncomfortable as it gets, the devil's going to tell you all the reasons why you shouldn't. He's going to tell you every, every detour that you need to take to stay away from it. You ignore that voice because there's another voice that's leading you to life, that's leading you to a divine appointment. You step into that. I promise the more you step into it, the more used to it you'll, you'll get. And you'll start knowing, whoa, that's God speaking. Whoa, that's not God speaking. Now, I don't know all of you that are down here. I know, I know some of you. And I know that you walk up right before the Lord. But I want you to understand, God is looking for a people today. Not only who are going to walk upright, but are willing to help others walk upright. This is the time and the season that we're in, church. I'm speaking to all of us here today. This is the day that we are in. Church can no longer thrive. Listen, the American church, you cannot sit back on your haunches and believe that because the church was strong for my granddaddy and my grandma and their parents and that we're a Christian nation, you can blow all that out of the water. Our future as believers in Christ depends on what we do in the present. For our city, for our state, for our nation. And while we can't take responsibility for what's happening in other states around the world or other cities, we will be responsible for what happens here. And we are not going to allow the devil to have his way. We're going to make it hard for people to go to hell in Cape Coral. Amen? Amen. Amen.